Building a hydrogen rocket engine. A long time ago, I learned about a special process of making rocket fuel from a rather unexpected source, water. This of course makes sense when you consider that water is composed of hydrogen and oxygen. These two reactive gases are the same ones used to power some of those powerful rockets ever built, although they are typically liquefied to increase the density. The process of electrolysis, typically confused with hydrolysis, uses an electric current to break the bonds of water molecules with the hydrogen gas collecting as bubbles on the negative side and half as much oxygen on the positive side. The convenient thing is with making fuel this way is that the propellants are always in the perfect ratio for combustion with no excess amount of either propellant. With the ability to produce fuel and oxidizer on demand, the only fitting thing is to build a rocket engine that can essentially run on water. Although the idea was simple enough, I needed to figure out a way to implement this in a way that was within my means of building and was on a scale that would be safe enough for the backyard in case of a catastrophic failure. Because pure water is a poor conductor, it needed an electrolyte added to allow electricity to flow reasonably well through the solution. Different electrolytes undergo various chemical processes during electrolysis, and it is important to select one that doesn't interfere with hydrogen production too much. I chose to use baking soda, also known as sodium bicarbonate, because it was the least nasty of the readily available options. It does produce some carbon dioxide, which I didn't think would be too much of a problem. This still seemed better than salt, which produces chlorine gas, or the best performing electrolytes, such as caustic lye or sulfuric acid, which can cause severe chemical burns. To make electrolysis work for more than a few seconds, the electrodes need to be very corrosion resistant, especially on the anode. For all the designs tested, I used 316L stainless steel for the electrodes. It is fairly cost effective and holds up reasonably well in an alkaline electrolyte solution. However, after prolonged use, it can still release metals into the electrolyte. As a first prototype, I used stainless scouring pads inside of some modified soda bottles, which can handle a surprising amount of pressure. Using PVC pipe parts and some stainless hardware for the base, I tapped threads and epoxied the bottles in place, putting some servo actuated valves on top to release the gas to a small rocket engine. I machined a small combustion chamber out of brass and aluminum and brazed on some feed tubes. With a simple control circuit completed, it's time to fill it up with electrolyte and test it out. Okay, first electrolysis test. That's using a standard power supply. Let's see. Turn it up. Okay, 30 volts. It's barely conductive, so this is not a very good electrolyte. But it looks like it's bubbling. Using a benchtop power supply as a power source, I was disappointed to discover how high the cell's resistance was, taking less than 200 milliamps and barely producing any visible gas. This was not good, and would have taken nearly three hours to pressurize the small volume on top of the bottles. After waiting nearly 10 minutes to make a large enough bubble, oh, yeah, it was reassuring hydrogen. to see that it was in fact hydrogen being produced oh, yeah. with this characteristic dim orange flame. Heating the electrolyte did improve performance somewhat, but it's starting to be pretty clear that this design was just not very good, and the high voltage applied to just a single cell meant the efficiency was absolutely horrible at just 3.9%. Because it takes only 1.23 volts per cell to split water, any more voltage just goes into overcoming the resistance of the electrolyte and is wasted as heat. As the next version, I used a stainless pot as the cathode as well as the pressure vessel, with another scouring pad on the inside with a plastic tube to separate the output gases so they could be stored more safely. Four minutes and we're just over 25 psi. Drawn a little under 50 watts, which is pretty good. I can increase that with the battery. This version had way less resistance, maximizing the current of the power supply and quickly building pressure in the chamber. This in theory would allow me to build up enough gas for a quick engine firing inside the chamber itself, if it was able to contain the pressure. Unfortunately, hydrogen is a particularly slippery gas, and this is no exception. Even with copious amounts of silicone at the top interface, nearly every screw had some sort of pinhole leak, and the pressure would stop rising at just above 20 or so psi. This also meant that the oxygen side would continue to produce gas and push all the hydrogen out until only the electrolyte came Three, out the hydrogen two, side and the valve one. was opened. This was also completely unusable, 
with everything from epoxy to hot glue doing nothing to stop the countless leaks. As a solution, I replaced the old pressure vessel with a stainless water bottle with only a single opening that could be sealed with a thick epoxy pour over the top. I printed a separator device that would keep the gases separate and allow an electrode to pass through the poured epoxy to permanently seal it off. I set up a long duration pressure test to see if it would seal well. Again, the chamber leaked on the hydrogen side, and soapy water showed it was coming from under the hose cover. I tightened the hose clamps and tried again, this time with a rocket engine attached so it could be tested if it built up enough pressure. In three, two, one. One. I don't think it lit. Unfortunately, from all the leaks, the only thing that came out of the hydrogen side was more electrolyte, preventing any ignition inside the chamber. At this point, I was feeling pretty discouraged about the whole idea of an electrolysis engine, and I stepped away from this project for a little over a year to focus on my studies as well as other projects. More recently, I got back into this project with a completely different goal, to build an electrolysis machine capable of continuously powering a small rocket engine, instead of fighting elusive leaks while waiting to build up pressure. This presented significant challenges such as getting enough power to run continuously, and making an entire system compact enough to not be outrageously large. One solution was combining the gas output to make a mixture known as Brown's gas, or HHO. This added a huge number of design and safety complications because the mixture of hydrogen and oxygen together could spontaneously combust in the presence of any ignition source. This means that flashback arresters needed to be added, as well as some form of non-catastrophic overpressure relief to any enclosed chamber to prevent dangerous explosions. It is also not a good idea to store any significant volume of this mixture for obvious reasons. However, despite its challenges, a combined electrolyzer is much easier to build using many stacked plates within the electrolysis chamber to get much higher efficiency in overall production. My first version of a combined output chamber was very small, meant to push current density limits and provide just enough gas to power a small pulse detonation engine at a rate of around 2 cycles per second. It used 8 layers of stainless foil, to divide the voltage with 3D printed spacers in between to prevent short circuits. This was sandwiched between two large heat sinks to maintain a stable temperature. The chamber was hooked up to an anti-flashback bubbler that was also designed to pop open at any pressure above 20 psi. I machined a small annular detonation engine around the centered stainless core of a commercial flashback arrestor, fitted with a truncated aerospike nozzle and a small spark plug. It was now time to give it a test. This engine was rather loud and snappy sounding, operating at near its predicted frequency with no signs of flashback. This meant that the built-in flame arrestor did its job, and the electrolysis cell performed as expected with a low but improved efficiency of around 22%. This is mostly due to the extremely high current density of the small plates, pushing over 300 milliamps per square centimeter. The chamber also ended up leaking after the test, and the foil plates had some slight discoloration after a couple minutes of runtime. A pulsed engine was pretty cool, but not exactly practical. Doing some calculations, I figured out that to run a tiny rocket engine continuously, I'd need to put over 3,000 watts into the production of hydrogen, which would be more than 10 times the output of the last design. Hoping to make up for some inefficiencies, I designed a 6 kilowatt chamber with an efficiency goal of around 50%. I stacked 5 sets of 14 plates separated by even more spacers, with a nylon threaded rod holding everything together. To prevent bypass current, I painted the outside of the metal box and added a layer of plastic insulating plates to the outside of the stack. Because the chamber is so much larger than any previous attempt, I needed a fail-safe pressure relief to release the overpressure in case of a flashback. I used a large foil tape rupture disc at the top of the chamber designed to burst at just under 30 psi. Fifteen, it does that. That's really bad. Wow. That 
That was impressive. After the leaks were fixed, the rupture disc was consistently bursting at 28 psi, which was just enough pressure to produce supersonic flow at the rocket nozzle. Designing the rocket nozzle itself, I found centered stainless plates that were the same pore size as the flashback arrestor and placed one near the rear end of the chamber. I settled on a 2mm throat size, which in theory would constrict the flow enough. This engine was comically small compared to its large electrolysis chamber. I hooked it up for a test, and using a remote control from across the yard, I turned it on. Happened. With successful ignition, the engine came to life, sustaining stable combustion and keeping combustion confined to its chamber. Unfortunately, the chamber got hot enough to melt off the feed line, and the electrolysis chamber appeared to be underperforming, with only about 6 psi of chamber pressure, certainly not enough to produce supersonic flow. The chamber took about 5.8 kilowatts of power as the electrolyte heated up, yet the efficiency is still fairly low at around 41%. This meant that the throat of the already tiny rocket engine was still too large to build up enough back pressure. Because the chamber was still working well enough, I decided to just remake the engine. After an unfortunate measurement error, I tried again making the chamber with the smallest throat I could reasonably drill at only 1.5 millimeters. This made the new engine by far the smallest one I have ever made at little over 3 centimeters long. It was still equipped with an internal flame holder mesh and both a bubbler and external flashback arrestor in case the internal mesh got too hot. Attached to the end of a lever with a thrust scale, it was ready to test. This test was much better than the last version, building up around double the pressure and still having stable combustion. A side effect of the smaller chamber and nozzle was the increased surface area to volume ratio, leading to greater heating of the chamber. As the electrolyte heated up, the system consumed nearly 200 amps, nearing 8 kilowatts of power. However, the combustion rate only slowed when in theory it should have increased as electrolysis efficiency increases with temperature. This can almost certainly be traced back to my electrolyte choice of sodium bicarbonate. At near ambient temperature, the anode produces mostly oxygen, but as the temperature increases to around 50 degrees Celsius, a greater fraction of the gas produced is carbon dioxide that is liberated from the electrolyte. This slows the reaction rate, displacing some of the oxygen produced, reducing the combustion rate. 
Even with the slow decline in performance, the engine got hot enough to start igniting the gas in the back side of the flame arrestor, causing a flash back into the bubbler. The braided line also began to melt, putting an end to the test. In terms of thrust, this engine had a somewhat inconsistent reading, but on average achieved nearly a newton of thrust. However, this could be an overestimate given that the electrolyte would occasionally be ejected, briefly increasing the mass flow rate. To actually achieve supersonic flow and get better performance, I would need to improve both the efficiency and power capabilities of my system, and just use a better hydroxide-based electrolyte with the right precautions. Running at a higher pressure is also important for better performance, which would warrant a redesign of the system, possibly the topic of an upcoming video. A system such as this has some niche applications, for example, as a means to propel a space probe between icy asteroids, where it can refuel and power an optimized version of an electrolysis-based thruster using stored solar power. This project has been a neat proof of concept for this type of thruster. Hydrogen fuel is very versatile, and a next generation of the setup can be used to power anything from energetic rotating detonation engines to high-impulse arc jets and MPD thrusters that rely on the light gas nature of hydrogen. I plan to continue development of this kind of system to eventually unlock its full potential and overcome even more of the design challenges.